So um, someone did have a question about Bosco and hopefully this answers that. Um, a little background on Bosco's landscape education program. Um, Bosco, the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency, is a special district that represents the interests of 26 cities, water districts, and private water companies, all which purchase wholesale water from the San Francisco Regional Water System. The Bosco member agencies collectively serve over 1.8 million residents and 40,000 businesses in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Alameda counties. Bosco provides a regional water conservation program to support all our agencies improving water use efficiency. The landscape education program is just one of these elements for water conservation in their program. While we've made significant strides in water use efficiency in the past decade, you, everyone here probably knows there's always room for improvement. Our water provides the single biggest potential source of untapped savings. And that includes rainwater. <laughs> Reducing outdoor water use through the use of water efficient plants or innovative techniques can help us conserve our water to ensure the future water supply needs of our community are met. Part of this program also includes, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Um, oh. um, we're here today to discuss the San Mateo County Rain Barrel Rebate Program. I'm sorry, Chris, I thought I was ahead of you. <laughs> um, and this program, specifically for San Mateo County, is brought to you by Flows to Bay, um, where we've partnered with Bosco to bring this rebate countywide. So no matter where you live in San Mateo County, you are eligible to receive um, a minimum of $50. And then we have participating agencies such as the City of Burlingame, Brisbane, Daly City, Millbury, Redwood City, and the City of San Mateo that also match the $50 for up to $100 rain barrel rebate. And um, I, you know, just to spread some potentially good news here, we're also exploring the possibility of expanding this rebate program to increase rebate amounts for larger barrels. Right now, um, the minimum size qualification for the rebate program is 50 gallons. However, we're exploring larger rain barrels as well as cisterns. So that information, TBD, um, will come to you at a future date if this is something that happens. So stay tuned to that. Next one, Chris. I'm just going to chime in in case we do have anyone who lives in an area covered by Valley Water. They do have a separate cistern rebate program as well that is done by the gallon. Thank you. Um, and then apart from the rain barrel rebate, there are additional ways to save. One is a new addition to our smart controller program. It provides instant rebates and heavily discounted pricing on purchases of the Rancho 3 irrigation controller. Uh, this controller can be operated on your smartphone, who doesn't love that, <laughs> and normally retails for 280 bucks. But through this program, um, our customers of participating water agencies can actually purchase this for $100 plus tax. So significant savings there. Last but not least, um, be on the lookout for a redesigned landscape rebate scheduled to launch July 1st of this year. Uh, the program will incorporate our LBG and RAIN barrel rebates while adding additional incentives for stormwater retention features as an example of a rain garden. For more information, however, go ahead and log into, or go ahead and visit bayareaconservation.org. We'll also be happy to take any questions on the rebate programs in the Q&A chat options, which Jen will be fielding and answering um, via text. Next up, if you are enjoying what you, find today in terms of information and fun. Um, there are plenty more events coming up. Here is a list, but again, no need to take notes. Um, you can find these events at bayareaconservation.org. We have some interesting things coming up, so make sure to check that out. 
If you are looking for additional resources on water efficient landscaping, make sure to check out bayareagardening.org for waterwise gardening tips and tricks. Um, the site supports residents in water efficient landscape renovations as well as management. Resources include a gallery of gardens with plants that are identified um, and a plant selection tool as well as a watering calculator so you know how much water needs to go into these gardens. And before we go on to our presentation, I do want to talk a little bit about Flows to Bay, which is co-sponsoring um, this event. Um, as we all know, water pollution affects us all in our communities um, as, as people and humans, but also um, wildlife out there. And it makes, you know, water unsafe for drinking, fishing, swimming, and doing kind of fun summer activities we all hope to be enjoying um, when we are allowed out. Close to Bay aims to educate and provide resources such as workshops like this to the residents of San Mateo County, um, and all in an effort to help reduce stormwater pollution for the betterment of our community, and again, including humans, wildlife, and our environment. I know some of you already have rain barrels, and hopefully after this session, everyone will go out and get one. And when you do, please make sure you include yourself on our map. We want to know how many people have rain barrels. We want to inspire neighbors in our community to do the same. Um, so please, flowstobay.org slash rain barrel and put yourself on the map. Next up, we will be sharing an exclusive discount that we have partnered with Hassett's Hardware to get 20% off um, two select rain barrels. So, you know, that helps, especially if you're getting $50 off the, re the rebate and then 20% off, everything helps and that gets you a rain barrel for uh, really cheap. Um, this will be emailed to you in the follow-up email and this offer is valid until June 30th of this year. One last note, um, don't run off when Chris is done. We will have both a raffle and a post-workshop survey. Um, in order to be in, uh, included in our raffle, we are giving away a 50 gallon rain barrel. Um, you will need to take the post-workshop survey. It's a quick two minute survey and will allow us to um, better serve our community and let us know how we're doing. So without further ado, I am extremely proud and happy to present our instructor in rain barrel installation specialist, Chris Corvetti. Well, welcome everyone. I am so excited that you guys are all able to make it here today. For those of you that just joined, we're going to be doing all Q&A during the presentation through that Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to save raising our hands for the end of the presentation when we get into the live question sections and we'll be able to unmute you to ask questions. But for now, we're going to practice raising our hands because I have a couple quick questions and I'm going to do a quick poll. So if your hands are raised now, go ahead and put them down. So click it again and it'll go down if you have it raised. It's a little tricky. Um, so it should tell you at the bottom if your hand is raised or not. Um, but what we're going to do is raise your hand now if you already have rain barrels installed on your property. Awesome. So we have a lot of people here that already know a bit about rain barrels. That's very exciting. So everyone go ahead and put your hands down. Okay. Now raise your hand if you already have a rain garden or a landscape garden that is watered primarily from rainwater. Awesome, this is really exciting. So we have some people that already have systems and a lot of people that are just interested in getting systems for the first time. So everyone can go ahead and put your hands down. I'm gonna head on into the presentation. So we're, why water, why, why harvest rainwater? That's the big question, right? That's why everyone's here. 
And most of these bullet points you guys already know. You know it's going to lower your water bill because you're getting the rainwater for free. Um, you know it's going to reduce moisture around your building because even if it's just 50 gallons that's being held in that tank, that's 50 gallons not going right next to your foundation. They can be really, really pretty. So they can definitely add aesthetic value to your home. Uh, it's, it's a pretty low maintenance system, so you can really have a system that is very self-sufficient and does not require much, much maintenance at all. And if you want to do a little bit more with your garden, you really do create a connection with nature. You can bring a lot of local wildlife closer to your home, birds, butterflies that are going to use it as habitat. It's going to help with erosion and flooding. You, you'll just have less quick flow of water going right into your landscaping, which is going to slow it down, especially for the rain barrels, it's just going to slow that water down. And then since you are slowing that water down, it'll have time to sink into the ground and replenish groundwater. Since it's not flooding, you're not going to have polluted runoff going into our creeks and the bay. So all around makes the whole environment a little bit happier. Uh, the system on the left is in Palo Alto at Arashadero Preserve behind one of their office buildings there. And even though they're all 55 gallon uh, recycled barrels, the whole system is almost a 500 gallon system. So without getting a big cistern, you are able to get a larger system and we'll talk about that a little bit later. When you think of rainwater harvesting, you probably think of rain barrels, which is one great option. And we're going to talk a little bit more of why rain gardens are also a form of rainwater harvesting. But there's also bioswales and permeable paving, which are really great for the area around your house. Permeable paving is just really wonderful because it lets the water soak in on your property. So that means all those plants that are, are near your driveway, near your walkway, are going to be getting a lot more water because it's not going to be running down your driveway into the road. There's two main types of permeable paving. On the bottom here, let's see if I can do it. Uh, you can see this permeable paving, the water runs right through the porous cement. And that's really common. It's more common in public parks where they have walkways that go through the park. That way the rain goes right underneath the walkway. But for your own home, something as simple as breaking up your concrete that you already have and then just replacing it with dirt in the middle is great. Or you can get um, pavers that look like these wonderful little uh, diamond shapes and those are great. You can drive a car on them, but you get plants you can put in between. It doesn't have to be grass. It can be dirt or gravel and that's just going to let the water soak into the ground, which is going to help all the plants on your property. Bioswales are a lot like rain gardens, except they don't always have the full garden feel. Sometimes they're just more of a dry creek bed look like the one on the left. And the design is really engineered to just allow maximum infiltration of water into the ground. So it's going to be a very sandy soil. It's going to have a lot of rock just to let that water really soak in quickly. But that leads us to a much more fun topic of rain gardens. So this native rain garden is at Donnelly Ave in downtown Burlingame, and it captures the water from the adjacent parking lot, which is really awesome because as we know, parking lots are just huge areas where water can't soak into the ground. It's a huge impervious surface. So being able to get all that water into a rain garden rather than straight into a creek or straight into the bay makes a huge difference on reducing the pollution that's going into the bay also going to keep the streets from flooding. It's going to keep the sewers from overflowing for, or, or storm drains from overflowing. And it's just truly beautiful. So it really enhances the landscape. It's also going to actually help cool down the parking lot because the greenery is going to make the whole area a little bit cooler. Um, if these plants are all native, you're going to have much reduced irrigation, which is really great. And of course, having rain gardens is always an educational tool for your neighbors. So let's take a quicker look at rain gardens, a closer look. So this is the anatomy of a traditional rain garden. So first thing you're really going to do if you want to install rain garden is start digging. And I know it sounds funny because you don't really think about digging out a ditch when you're doing a rain garden, but you can see in this picture 
this whole area is dug out. And on the bottom, we started with drainage rock. So you want somewhere from two to six inches of a crushed gravel or a drainage rock. That's gonna allow just really good water flow in the bottom. On top of that, you want somewhere from two to five inches of bioswale soil mix. So that bioswale soil is a soil mixed with sand. So it's very sandy, which means it doesn't really hold the water very well, but it lets the water really soak in. And so it'll, it'll soak right through and it will help um, to let the water sink into the environment. On the top, we have our river rocks. Now, this is very much a stylized choice. So whatever you like best, these can be larger cobbles or smaller river rocks. Um, I generally use like two inch, two to four inch river rocks when I do mine because I, I find them attractive. But I've seen people do them with large, like six inch, six inch cobbles. And the idea is that you're just giving the water an area that it can pond or essentially have that flooding effect, which we're gonna see on the next slide really nicely. It will have that flooding effect during a rain event. And then all of that extra drainage rock and bioswale soil is gonna allow that water to slowly soak in to spread that water rather than having it all run off. On the sides, in this picture, you can see we have mulch and we have raised berms. And the raised berms just kind of contain that water where we want it. And the mulch is a way to stop weeds. So one of the things I really like to do is called sheet mulching, and that's putting down cardboard. And this is, you know, basic cardboard that all your Amazon orders come in. And so you put that down first, and then you put three to five inches of mulch for a new garden. And you can plant your plants right through the mulch, through the cardboard. You just cut a hole in the cardboard to plant your plants. But that cardboard is going to keep weeds from really starting up and it'll biodegrade and then you'll have a sustainable garden. Um, you can also hook up a rain garden to rain barrels. And one of the things a lot of people ask is how big should my rain garden be? So we're gonna look at just the size and what you wanna think about when you're looking at size. Hey Chris, so, we yeah. did have a question from the audience um, regarding oh. um, rain gardens specifically the risk of mosquitoes when it comes to rain gardens, or is there a way to reduce that? Um, so as far as mosquitoes breeding, the entire design of a rain garden is for that water to sink in. And that's actually a really good point. That's exactly what I'm heading into here. So in this top right picture, you can see this is temporary flooding or what we call ponding. And it is very temporary. So this is actually that same garden, I think, that we looked at earlier, um, where it looked like a dry creek bed. I'm going to go back to this picture. So here you can see it looks totally dry. It's a totally dry creek bed. But then when it starts raining, it fills and it floods. And the whole idea of that is all that water that would be either flooding the parking lot or going right into the creek, carrying all that brake dust, all the oil from the cars, everything that we really don't want in our waterways, it's now gonna go right into this rain garden. And since the rain garden doesn't flow into the creek, it, it'll sit there and pond like this. It, all of those contaminants will actually be held in the ground and filtered out by these rocks. So the ponding is not permanent. It is not long enough for mosquitoes to breed. It is called temporary ponding. And right now you can see it's in this picture, it's actively raining. So it's actively filling this rain garden. And when that rain stops, within a couple hours, this water's all gonna soak right into the ground. And these are really engineered gardens specifically designed to hold that water and then soak it into the ground. Susie, was there a follow-up question on that, or is that? Nope, they would just want to know if there were anything they could do to avoid um, getting mosquitoes in their rain garden. Yeah, definitely 
definitely just making sure you have enough drainage for the amount of gallons of water you're going to have. So we're going to take a look at how many gallons of water will come off your roof. So a thousand square foot roof can capture over 600 gallons of rainwater from a one inch of rain. So there's this wonderful equation here that tells you exactly how much rain your house capture, it has a harvesting potential of, and how much water hits your roof. So figure out the square footage of your roof, multiply it by the inches of rain you're expecting in each storm, and multiply it by the conversion of factor of 0.6. That's gonna give you your total gallon. So we're gonna take a closer look at that. So there's the equation again. And here it is for Burlingame. So an average rain event is about half an inch, sometimes even less here, but we're gonna go with half an inch. So in a half inch rain event, we're looking at over 300 gallons of water for a thousand square foot roof. Your roof is definitely gonna be bigger than a thousand square foot feet most likely, but on average, one downspout is gonna be about a thousand square feet, depending on how far apart your downspouts are. So we're gonna talk about that a little later, but you do wanna look at your downspouts before you install a system and kind of figure out what gets the most rain. Uh, in a year, Burlingame gets an average of 23 inches of rain. So in an entire year, you have the harvesting potential for a thousand square foot roof capturing over 14,000 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. You're not gonna put in a tank that big, but you don't need to because you're gonna use that water in between rain events. So even a 50 gallon tank like this one on the left, a converted wine barrel, if it gets used between every event, it will fill up every time it rains and you can continue using it. So that's 14,000 gallons of water that you don't need to buy from the city that you're using with your rain barrel system. Um, rain barrels are a little more effective at storing the water for later use. As we talked about, rain gardens fill and drain quickly. That is their design because we don't want mosquitoes. Rain barrels are designed to store the water. So you can store the water and use it through the entire dry season. A lot of people always ask me, well, can I store the water for six months? Can I store it for a year? Yes, rainwater is safe to store. I wouldn't store it for a year because it rains more than once a year here. And so you really should be using it and using it up before each rainfall to get that new water in there and just try to capture more, more water. But you can store it through the entire dry season to dole it out as needed. So we already talked about a lot of these great benefits for having it, having a rain barrel. And so we're gonna talk a little bit more about the systems themselves, unless we have some questions up to this point. We have some late questions on rain gardens um, sure. that we can save till the end, unless you wanna take them now. Oh, I'll take them now, that's fine. Okay. Um, we have a great question from Kathy about how far should your rain garden be from your house foundation? Any, any guidelines there? I wouldn't go within 18 inches of your house. Um, you really want the water to drain away from your house. Um, I say 18 inches because it's a little bit of a random number, I guess, but it's about the distance that the water is going to want to infiltrate into the ground for the ground type that I have in front of my house. Um, this picture in the bottom left, uh, sorry, excuse me, bottom right, of the screen right here. This is my front yard. This is my rain garden at my house. And what you can't see is at this end right here, it does actually connect to my downspout and I have an 18 inch downspout um, extender that goes to feed into it. Um, and that allows the water to flow down this dry creek bed. And the creek bed actually never fills. We did ours pretty deep. So I've never actually in any rainstorm seen water sitting at the top of it. Um, it's also only capturing from about a quarter of my roof, so it doesn't really get the entire rain flow from my roof um, from that downspout. So you really won't, you won't have the flooding issues you're thinking, but it is always nice if you're trying to fl flow the water away from your house 
make your ditch just a little bit deeper on the farther side away from your house and the water is going to want to flow downhill so that you don't have ish any issues of that wonderful rain feature coming back towards your foundation. And I would just like to add that if you're doing this as part of a rebate program, you're going to want to look at your, your cities or that program specifications. Some of them do have a required minimum specification distance that you have to be from your house foundation when they come and check that. So um, if you're doing this as part of a rebate program, please check that rebate program um, specifications. And then just one more and we'll get back on track with rain uh, barrel. Also with that I think that there's also some of the rebates have specifications on how far it has to be from the road or public property mm -hmm. um, or your neighbor's house. Um, for your neighbor's house, it is usually 18 inches from the property line. I'm not sure from the, the road. So that's also something great to check. We left three feet between our garden and the road. Um, we were not applying for a rebate program because we did not have a lawn to replace. We had already torn out the lawn five years before and then finally planted the garden. So we were not eligible for the rebate program. Yes, great, great point there, um, Chris. And then just one more um, from Emily. Is there something we should be doing and periodically perhaps from time to time to clean the rocks that are part of filtering the pollutants in a rain garden? The, the rain is really gonna, it's gonna keep them clean. I mean, if you're, if you're seeing bits of plastic, if you're seeing anything that's big enough to pick up, definitely go out and pick it up um, so that it doesn't eventually end up out in the road. Uh, you're not going to, stuff like brake dust and the little bits of oil that come from your car in your driveway, just are, they're not going to be significant amounts that you're going to notice them in your garden. But, you know, if everyone does this, it's a significant amount that's taken out of our creeks. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to the rebate program really quickly, uh, just to remind people that for any of the rebates, you do need to apply for the rebates before purchasing anything. So definitely look at your rebate um, requirements and don't just run out and buy a rain barrel. Don't just go out and tear out your yar yard. We really want you to do that, but you know, we want you to get the rebate too. So make sure you apply for them first. And then Chris, hopefully we can do one last question yeah, really quickly. Um, an average size yard of how deep you would need to dig for a rain garden. Is there a rule so of thumb? The same thing, you're really gonna want to look at these equations and you're gonna wanna calculate how much water is coming out of that one downspout. Um, you know, how much square footage of your roof is coming from the downspout you're feeding your garden or if you're feeding your garden from your rain barrel, how much water you're gonna be putting into it. And then you can calculate how many gallons you need that garden to hold. You can also set up an area for that garden to kind of overflow towards, um, usually wherever that rain would have gone anyway. And um, as far as depth, you're looking at, let's get back to that slide. You're looking at anything from a minimum of like six inches, two inches for each of these up to like 24 inches, depending on how ambitious you are. Ours is about 14 inches deep in my front yard. This one um, is about 14 inches deep. Like I said, we never see the water filling it. Um, it's 14 inches deep. It's four feet wide at the bottom, about a foot wide at the top. And it, we can't dig any farther. We get down to hard pan. So that's as far as we could dig. And we just called it good. But it really, it, for our size roof, it was way more than we needed. All right, we'll keep going with the rain barrels, Chris. Perfect, so moving back into rain barrels, we're gonna talk about choosing your system. So I think we really covered looking at your harvesting potential or your roof size. Um, part of your roof size is your number of downspouts, right, because you know, my house, for the front of our house, we have three downspouts. Some houses will have only one or two, and some will have up to five or more on just one side of your house. So even though the square footage of your house, you know, might be 3,000 square feet, might be more, your actual section of the roof you're looking at when you're looking at your harvesting potential 
is the amount of that roof that flows into the downspout you're hooking up to. So you're not looking at your whole house and saying, I'm gonna capture all that in this one barrel. You can't, you're, you're not gonna get your entire house into one barrel because the water is gonna flow down different sides. Um, it's kind of like the continental divide of your house. It's gonna land on you know, north, south, east or west. It's not gonna all land in one place. Um, you do wanna think about your installation space. So you wanna think about where do I wanna put it? I wanna get the barrels as close to my downspouts as possible so I don't need to divert the water so much farther to get to the barrels. You wanna think about where you're gonna use the water. If you want to run the water into a rain garden in your front yard, you probably don't wanna put the barrel in your backyard. If you wanna use it to irrigate a garden in the backyard, you may not want your rain barrel in the front yard. Uh, you also wanna think about your drainage or your overflow. Um, sometimes it's nice to have some sort of a swale to overflow into or a rain garden to overflow into. Uh, you also want to think about aesthetics. Is it an attractive barrel? This one in the picture I find very attractive. I think it was a great artist that did the painting on it. I am not that nice of an artist, so I would not be able to paint that on any of my own barrels. So for me, something like a wine barrel would be a little bit more attractive. And so it's really your own opinion as well for aesthetics. So we're gonna take a look at the anatomy of a rain barrel. And then on future slides, we're actually gonna go through each part of this. I just want you to see it all as a whole before we break it down into individual parts. So on this barrel, our water is flowing in right here at the top. And I should, I'm gonna switch to a different color because all my markings on this page are already red. I guess that was a bad color to switch to. Okay, how about neon green? Okay, so our water is coming in. We, I, I'm gonna not be able to choose a good color apparently. Um, our water is coming in at the top. There we go. Down that downspout, and then it flows through the leaf eater at the top, and that leaf eater is a screen. It's a tilted screen, it's a very special part. Um, that tilted screen takes most of the leaves that hit it and it lets them kind of fly off with the wind. And it's also really easy to clean. So we'll talk about that later, but it provides a, an additional layer of screening as your water goes into your tank. Then your water's in your tank and it's filling up, it's filling up, it's filling up, and now your water line's here. So if you wanna check that water line, because you're really not sure how much water you have in your tank, there is something called a depth gauge. And so this depth gauge, you can see here, this line on the left is my empty mark. This one on my right is full. And it's a little hard to see, but the black knob is fully on the full there. So the, the, with the depth gauge, it doesn't necessarily start from the far bottom and go to the far top. You're gonna calibrate it to the, the size of your tank. This particular depth cage can handle up to about 600 gallons. This is a 265 gallon tank. So our range of empty to full right here is this little arc on the top. So next up we have our strapping. So all tanks that I install in public locations, I strap for earthquake proofing, for kid proofing, pet proofing, anything that's gonna climb on it. And I assume the worst when I strap. In your own house, strapping is optional. It's up to your decision. I do recommend it, especially if you have kids, strapping to something really sturdy. Rain barrels weigh a lot when they're full. So once they get full, you know, water is uh, over eight pounds per gallon. So think about 50 gallons. It fills up, it gets heavy very fast. So we're gonna talk about leveling the ground and setting up your base, but just think about how much weight in the event of an earthquake you're gonna have. So strapping it can help prevent that, but also with that much weight, it's not gonna to wanna to move. So it, it is totally optional, but I always recommend strapping. Then we have our overflow up here. Um, in this case, this barrel overflows out to a rain garden, which is really, awesome because you can see it's on a cement pad. There really was nowhere to overflow it to in this location. So we actually dug a pit, we dug a trench line and we buried it to go about 15 feet to a rain garden 
So you can bury your overflow and get it a little farther away from your house. Um, for the output, this one has a split output. So you can see the ball valve here. We're gonna talk a little bit more about outputs. But this one, you can turn on that ball valve and this ball valve, and that will run it out to a hose. And if instead you turn on this one in the back, that will actually run the water straight out to the rain garden. So for this particular system, when we know we're getting a next, our next rainstorm is, you know, tonight, tomorrow, they just go out there, they drain the entire barrel into the rain garden, let it soak into the ground, and then refill it on the next storm so that we're using that water in between. Um, for this bottom output, you can see we have timers on it. So the whole system is fully automated. We have a filter on it, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about those different parts as we go through. Susie, any questions for the basic anatomy or should I head through to the other parts before we answer them? Yes, we'll probably have a couple coming up, but nothing for the anatomy part. Perfect, thank you. So now looking at some of those components, just more in depth and individually, um, you have your inflow and your overflow. Those were, you know, the, the two top parts that are high up on the barrel. Um, so for the inflow, you have two options. That picture we looked at before it took the entire entirety of that downspout and poured the whole thing into the rain barrel. You also have the option of only diverting part of the downspout. So that is what this system down here does. So as the water comes down, it's gonna come down along the edges of the pipe mostly. It will flow into here and then through this tube into your barrel. When your barrel fills, it will actually overflow back out this tube, up over this little rubber gasket, and down your drain pipe. So, sorry for my squiggly drawings, but hopefully that makes sense. So, in this instance here, your inflow and your overflow are actually just one piece. One pipe you install, bam, done. Um, for all of your inflow and your overflow, you must have screening. This is how you keep your mosquitoes out of your system. I'm glad people are thinking about mosquitoes because that definitely is an issue. Uh, something as simple as basic window screening works great for this. And you just cut, you know, a little three to four inch square section and you would install it right here on your on your system. So it would go just where that is coming out of your downspout and into your barrel so that there's no standing water for mosquitoes to breed in. Um, it is required in the state of California to have that screening to prevent mosquitoes breed breeding, but it also helps just decrease pollutants in your system. Um, we're going to talk a little more about a leaf feeder and a flush slush diverter, which are different parts of your inflow that we brushed on earlier. For your overflow, you obviously want it really high on the barrel because any, any water above the overflow is just going to not stay in the barrel. It's going to overflow. And so as high up on the barrel as you're able to get it. You can connect your overflow to a garden or a swale, but it must drain on your property. Um, unless you already have a French drain, which we'll look at in the next slide, um, you have to make sure that anywhere you're putting your overflow, you can't set your overflow pipe to drain on your neighbor's property. You can't set your overflow pipe to drain right out onto the street. It has to drain onto your own property. That is a law in the state of California. Um, it's really easy to do because essentially you're going to put your overflow probably wherever your downspout already was, or maybe, you know, 12 inches farther away from your house than where your downspout was. And Chris, this brings me to a couple of questions we had specifically about a downspout. Does the inflow necessarily need to be connected to the downspout? Um, or if you're kind of using the rain barrel in an open area, what are the, what are the options if, if there are any? Um, so, I mean, you need, you need something to collect your water. The easiest way to collect your water is from a roof. Um, in fact, when you, if you go on Google and Google rainwater harvesting, two thirds of the time, your search is going to tell you it is taking water from a roof as a definition. Obviously, I disagree with that. I think that rainwater harvesting can be a garden. It can be other things as well. 
but for the most part with barrels, you're taking that water from a roof. So you're going to take it then through your, through your gutters and into your downspout into the barrel. If you wanted to do a rain barrel, you know, out in the middle of a field, um, there are ways to do it with a tarp so that the water then feeds into something and into a barrel. It's a lot more complicated. I'd be happy to talk with someone more directly about their own situation. Um, we'll send my email out with the follow-up email and you're welcome to email me and I can go over some more options with you. As for the points of this presentation, I really think capturing from your roof is the most applicable use of a rain barrel. Thanks, Chris. Okay. For your output, so how do you want to use your water? So that's something you really want to think about. Um, you know, someone asked earlier about pumps. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. You know, do I want to put it on a drip irrigation system? Do I want to manually turn on that drip irrigation and run it? Or do I want to walk away and not look at it for a month and have it run on a timer? Uh, do I want to water everything with a hose? Are you a very hands-on person? Um, you know, are you using it only to water your roses and they really need very specific watering so you do it all by hand? Um, are you going to use watering cans for everything? Or do you just want this to go into a landscape feature such as a rain garden or a landscape pond or a creek or bird bath? For a landscape pond or a bird bath or a waterfall or any water feature where the water stays out, you do need a permit to do that from a rain barrel. For any basic irrigation, you do not need a permit. Rain barrels do not require permits. You just need to make sure you have that screening on them so that you can't get insects into them. That is the only real requirement in the state of California. Um, so we're not really gonna talk about those water features. We're gonna talk more about how to use this water for landscaping uh, with plants. So with drip irrigation, you have the option of a timer. So this top image actually is a nice sophisticated system that I have set up. And it is a 265 gallon barrel that runs water through two separate systems. So the first thing that's really important is I have a filter on here. And the reason I have a filter on here is because I'm running it through a timer and I'm running one side down here into a soaker hose and the other side up here through drip irrigation. Now, drip irrigation is a lot of little holes in the pipe and little holes fill up very quickly with any particulates that are in your water and they will get clogged. So putting this filter on the system keeps it from clogging and allows me to run my drip irrigation on a timer. I have these set not to run at the same time so that the pressure will stay pretty good when they're running individually. These are all gravity fed. So with the gravity fed, I have all my irrigation system as a zero pressure irrigation system. And it is specifically designed for gravity fed systems. Um, that being said, you would not wanna hook up your rain barrel to your current pressurized drip irrigation system because it will not have the same pressure that you get coming out of your hose or your municipal water supply. It does need its own special system or a pump, which we'll talk about in a couple slides. Um, my favorite output method is a ball valve. You'll see in every picture. I love just a basic ball valve, so it's on, off. And with this one, if I were to unhook everything past this line, I would be able to fill a watering can. Or in this case, I have it running through a filter to a hose, and this runs to a pump and another hose. Um, so we talked about French drains. French drains are where the water goes underground. You may or may not know where your downspouts go if you have a French drain because you don't see where the water comes out. So this, this is, for intents and purposes, essentially a French drain, uh, but this is a buried pipe. So usually a French drain, we'll see in a later picture what they look like for your house. Um, so in this case, we have our overflow coming down this pipe. It goes underground for 30 feet and then overflows into a rain garden. And our output is down here. We have a faucet right there. So we have a faucet right here that we can fill watering cans. And then the rest of our output comes down. It's also buried 30 feet and goes into a drip system. So there is a filter right there on the other side. 
Um, so we're going to look at some of the accessories now. We're going to start with our info accessories and then and then we'll talk about the pump as well. Um, so we talked about a first flush diverter, or we talked about a leaf eater earlier already. So you can see a leaf eater right here. And um, a leaf eater you'll almost always put before a first flush diverter if you're going to install a first flush diverter. So this picture on the right is an example of what the inside of a first flush diverter looks like. The idea is your water comes down into the top through your leaf eater into your first flush diverter. And then all of those particulates that you get in that first flush of water will kind of settle in here. And then as the water level rises up, there's a gasket right here and the ball will come up and hit that gasket. And that will close it so then all your water after that first flush will go right into your barrel. Um, this is set to slowly drip out on the bottom and that water will slowly drip allowing for that first flush, the water, but not the sediment to slowly run out so that when you have your next drain, it will take the first flush from the next drain as well. Now you do need to maintain and clean a first flush diverter. So you have to have the ability to do that if you install one. They're really great if you are gonna be doing drip irrigation from your barrel, or if you're concerned about any additional particulates in your system, or if you're in a really high dust area. Um, if you really aren't going to do the maintenance, a first flush diverter may not be for you. If you live in an area where you just don't have a lot of particulates, your house is very wide open, you know, you don't have a lot of dust flying around, then you probably don't need a first flush diverter. Um, if you're going to be using a hose or a watering can, not a drip system, you don't really care if you get a little bit of dirt in your system because the plants don't mind it and it's going to come out that bigger opening. Um, also, if you have a really small water shed, like as a tool shed or a storage shed, you just, you really don't need it. Um, it's going to be longer, closer to like four feet. So you can see this one in the picture is much longer. Um, this one is four feet in the picture. The barrel is just fairly large. And then you can see after it fills, the water all comes down and into the center of my barrel. So moving on with some of our other accessories. Wait, Chris, before we do, so oh, sorry, sure. a couple of questions um, which may be related to having the um, flush or, or not. Uh, there are a couple of questions out there regarding particulates, especially if you're using rainwater for an edible garden um, or for fruits and veggies, which is the same thing. But um, is, it sa is the water safe to use from a rain barrel to your edible garden? Yes. But wash your things before you eat them. Okay. And um, then, okay. Oh, I mean, that's the simplest answer. Yes, absolutely. I water all my vegetables with rainwater. I get much bigger vegetables. I've had tomato plant that never died. I harvested it for two years nonstop. And I did it all with, with stored rainwater. And I finally tore it out because we were sick of tomatoes and we couldn't kill it. So <laughs> um, it really, the plants will love the rainwater. Just wash, wash your plants really well. This is the same water you, the plants would normally get naturally. It is very healthy. You will see a little bit more pollen in your barrel than you would normally see on the ground just because it's getting kind of concentrated into that barrel. Plants like pollen, it's okay, they're fine. And would that be the same thing regardless of your roof type? Like if you have a composite shingle versus something else? That is an excellent question. I was going to get to that at the end of the accessory. Okay. I am we happy can wait. to deal with it right now. <laughs> we can I'm wait. <laughs> we can um, wait. <laughs> so roof types, if you have a tin roof, a clay roof, a ceramic roof, a cement roof, or a rubber roof, you're golden. You got nothing to worry about. Your water is going to come off with minimal to no nothing from your roof. If you have shingles or shakes, which let's face it, most of us do. I have shingles. We had shakes before. That's when you start thinking about certain other things. So when you get a new cement shingle roof, disconnect your rain barrel system for the first two to three rainfalls. The reason for that is a brand new roof sheds a little bit of of those little pebbles that are on the top. So you'll see that kind of coming in. 
you don't really want that to be in your rain barrel because they do treat that it's treated with tar it's treated it's treated so you really don't want that to go into your garden as much but after those first two to three rainfalls your roof's going to stop shedding it's really not going to have that coming off of it so then you're really fine as for shakes shakes are a little bit more interesting i still say hook it up use it i might not do the vegetables if i had a shake roof um or i probably wouldn't do root vegetables the vegetables like tomatoes that are above ground are probably okay i wouldn't do really carrots with it and the reason for that is um shakes a lot of times were previously treated with biocides algicides fungicides oil they're treated with different things to make them last longer because they are just wood and so they don't want them to decompose so as long as you aren't actively treating them with those biocides, algicides, or fungicides, they really are fine to use for your rainwater. But if you are actively treating them, I would not use that for capturing rainwater just for, for veggies and stuff. For your basic irrigation, it's, it's really not going to hurt the plants too much. But I, I, I don't advocate for actively treating the roots because you are it is trying to kill plants. So it's, it's not going to be as good for your plants. Excellent. And then just really quickly, um, someone asked what, if you can just give us the lowdown, what's the basic maintenance of a first flush diverter? What does that kind of involve? Uh, so yeah, we're going to get to maintenance of the whole system at the very end, but okay. for a first flush diverter, I, I'll do that real quick. First flush diverter, the maintenance is super easy. You will unscrew this cap. And then you will take a brush and run the brush up over this filter and on the cap itself it'll it'll be kind of covered in dirt. I I usually do this twice a year and which is about the minimal maintenance and at uh, twice a year I get like a quarter inch of sediment um, from fairly small watersheds and so I just take a powered hose and kind of run it up in there really quick and make and take the brush and clean the sediment out and then I put the whole thing back together. It takes me all five minutes. Okay and last before we get going asphalt shingles are they okay? Yeah shingles shingles are fine but again for the first if you get a new if you get a new roof um, for the first two to three rainfalls you really don't want to be capturing that water because the roof is going to shed in that first first couple rainfalls just because it's brand new. And you'll if you've ever had a new roof, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And when you do get a new roof, you'll see what I'm talking about. All around every one of your downspouts, you'll have just a little puddle and it'll look like, you know, sandy pebbles, but that's from your roof. Okay, so coming back to this, we already talked about the depth gauge. Um, a depth gauge is, is truly an optional accessory. If you tap the side of your barrel, you will be able to hear where it goes from sounding full to hollow, and that is the depth of your barrel. So the depth gauge does, this type of depth gauge does not give you a specific gallon amount. It's just going to tell you a percentage, essentially. The way it works is you, there's a little cover you pop off. When your barrel is empty, you drop this bob all the way to the bottom and you set your empty and then you pull this little floaty bob all the way up to the top and you set that as your full mark on your barrel. And super easy and then you can at a glance see how much water is in your tank. Um, we've pretty much talked about the leaf eater. It can act as that required screening although I often do that and then the screening as well underneath it just as a second layer. Um, they're great to have also just an accessory you know we accessorize our clothing, we accessorize everything else. You might as well accessorize your rain barrel. Um, super easy to clean. You just, the screen on top pops off. You can see a little tab here. And that whole top part pops off. You can clap it against the side of the barrel and all the leaves will come off of it and then you put it right back on. About once a year, I take a brush to it and that's, that's all it takes. Um, for a pump. If you really prefer using a hose to water and you want to water an area that is higher than your rain barrel, so the gravity feed just isn't gonna work, 
Or if you want to use a drip system, but you just feel like your barrels don't have enough pressure from their capacities, like a 50 gallon barrel sometimes really, a 50 gallon barrel really won't do a drip system for more than 20 feet. And you really do want to have that barrel raised up a little bit even to do that full 20 feet. Um, once you get into larger barrels, such as that 265 or the 500, or when you're daisy chaining together, you can drip irrigate a lot larger area just on gravity. But if you want to use a pump, I really like this one. Um, this is called an on-demand pump. It's not waterproof. Without making a housing for it, you cannot leave it sitting outside. But it is an on-demand pump. So if you set it up with a timer, the pump will only turn on. It has to be plugged in for electricity, but it will only turn on when that timer turns on to run water through it. So you can create a waterproof you know, toolbox or housing for it that will allow it to run on a timer and do everything automated for you. Um, it, it's very easy to set up. It comes with its own adapters that hook up hoses on both ends and you can connect your hose and use it. Um, and it essentially just pressurizes your system so that you get the pressure that you'd have like city water. And Chris, there are pumps that run both on batteries and like 115 volt outlets. Yes, there are many. This is this is about the the cheapest model, that, and I highly recommend it because it's a workhorse. But you can get definitely different types of pumps. And does capacity matter? Um, can you use a pump on a 50 gallon, or does it have? Or does it make more sense to use it on a larger? Right in many ways, it makes more sense to use it on a 50 gallon because you won't have it the same head pressure from gravity. Um, you know, on a 265 gallon tank when it's totally full, there's a lot of weight on that water on the bottom, right? All the weight of the water above it is pushing down from the, from the pressure of gravity, and that is going to give you your pressure. Um, but once you get down to the bottom 100 gallons or 50 gallons in those big tanks, then a pump really does help. But as long as you're using your hose at a lower level than your tank, so if, you know, our, my lawn at least slopes a little bit downhill. So for me, I don't need a pump at home because everything's kind of sloping away from my rain barrel. So gravity is helping me. So I'm just gonna kind of, we're, we're actually at an hour already and I, I wanna walk you guys through how to install at your home. So I'm just gonna blow through the different types of barrels really quickly since we've seen a lot of them already. These are wine barrels. I'm gonna give you guys a handout fully how to convert a wine barrel into a rain barrel. Everything you need to do it yourself. You can buy them at local wineries. Um, these were donated by Testeros and August West Wines for a nonprofit I did the installations for they can look really pretty. Food grade barrels on the left, we have olive oil barrels. On the right, we have Coca-Cola product barrels. Um, the ones on the right are from Blue Barrel Systems. They sell as an entire kit. You can go on their website at bluebarrel.com, or I think. If you just search Blue Barrel Systems, it will come up on Google. And they are able to be purchased in South San Francisco and you do all the purchasing online and then you just go to the transfer station to pick them up very easy to do. They're really cool because the, you can see the water comes out through the bottom. So you actually have no water left in the tank when you're using it, which is actually really cool. Cisterns are larger tanks. Um, cisterns can go up to very huge amounts. Um, for self DIY installations, I don't really recommend going above a 500 gallon cistern. When you get the 500 gallons, I do recommend pouring a concrete pad for the bottom, as you can see we did here, just giving it something really sturdy to sit on. We're going to talk a little bit more about the basis for your barrels coming up. Um, this is a 265, we've already seen this one. And this is a slimline tank, so it only comes out about two feet from the wall, which is really nice if you have a little bit of a narrower area and they're, they're fairly attractive. Um, if you want to get that higher capacity, but you really don't have enough space for a cistern or a larger tank, you can daisy chain together multiple barrels. Um, so this is actually on the left. This is the barrel that we will be raffling if you do your survey at the end. And it's a really attractive barrel and you can see you can use the top as a planner. 
Um, but you can also then go out and buy another one and daisy chain them together if you want and get a little bit more capacity. Then you have the basic rain barrel kits. Um, the one on the left is called a raindrop box. Um, this is designed, this was designed, it's 50 gallons by a local high school student a few years ago as her senior project. And she did a GoFundMe. And so these are available um, out of San Mateo. Um, and I can, if you want the information, you can email me and I can send you that. But that's kind of a funky local one. But then if you go online, you can get ones that look like rocks or again, the one we're raffling off, which you can see here. Okay, so installing your barrel, I'm gonna go fairly quick. And I do realize, Susie, are we, do I have time to go through this? We're, we're a little over time, or are we okay? We're a little over time, but um, we still have a healthy amount of participants on the line. If we can run this through real quick, and then we have some additional questions at hand to get to it as well. Okay, great. So I'm going to run through this as quickly as possible. Um, so this is what your barrel looks like. This is if you bought two of them. Um, so the first barrel ends right here. Um, and this is what it looks like when you get it home from the hardware store. So you go to House of Hardware, you use that rebate, you get this barrel for 80 bucks. Awesome. because Or use the discount coupon for it, to get it for 80 bucks. And then use your rebate and it's fully covered, entire cost. So really cool system that you can do for free thanks to Flows to Bay and Basqua and our local agencies. Um, so it's gonna come with the barrel and then with a bag that has all these kits and all these items in it. So we're just gonna go through how to use each of these items to install your barrel. First, we already talked about, you wanna figure out where you want your barrel. Next, you wanna set up a solid base for your barrel. You do not need to pour a concrete pad. If you are getting a 500 bar gallon barrel, I do recommend considering pouring a concrete pad. Um, or if you already have one adjacent to your house, that's great. Just check its level. Um, but you can use pavers, you can use rocks, or you can build a wooden frame and fill it with rocks. This one is a wooden frame. It's filled to about that line with rocks and then the barrel sitting in it. It's installed at a preschool. So we custom built the frame to be very close so kids couldn't reach their hands in and pull rocks out. Um, so those are your three options. You just wanna tamp it and get it level before you install your barrel. Uh, you can also do it on a pallet or a wooden frame um, or a wooden, a wooden base, but I like the stone, stone base because it's gonna last a little longer. Um, next up, you've got your barrel placed, you've got your base set up, you're next to your downspout. So you wanna take a look at that hole where you installed for the start of your barrel, where your input's gonna go and you want to make sure it's level with the center of the hole that you're going to drill. So you want your holes to be pretty much level. If you're not sure if it's level and your, your level is a little bit hard to tell, you can try to do your hole just a tiny bit higher than the barrel. That way the water will still want to flow into the barrel. So you will need your own power drill, but the kit will come with the drill bits for the hole saw and you'll use the larger bit to drill a hole in your downspout. Then you'll pinch the sides of the diverter in the second picture, or third picture, I guess, top right. And you'll pinch the sides and put it right in the hole. It'll sit there quite nicely. As you can see in the bottom picture, it will fill your entire downspout. And then you just put two sheet metal screws, one top, one bottom. If you ever decide to remove your kit, your barrel, your kit comes with a cap. So you can put a cap on that hole and then all your water will go down the downspout. Next up, you have two pre-drilled holes in the bottom of your barrel. One is for a spigot, one is for a hose. It will come with these little teardrop things. You just pinch them into an M shape, shove them through the hole and then push them outwards to make them kind of fill in that whole space. Those are threaded, so your spigot will just thread right in and your hose adapter will thread right in. It comes with a cap on it. If you do wanna hook up a hose, hook up a hose before you fill it with water because it's gonna be really hard to take that cap off to hook the hose up once you have water in the tank. You can also buy an additional ball valve to put a ball valve, ball valve on there to make it a little easier to turn the water on and off. Um, for the top part, you will use that smaller hole drill bit that they give you 
and there's a little nub on the barrel that you set the drill bit into, or if you have a friend or neighbor who's more experienced with using a hand drill than you are, have them do it and they'll get you a nice clean hole. And then it comes with this rubber gasket and the hose pushes right into that rubber gasket. So then you have your screen. Obviously you'll put your screen right here like we talked about earlier. And then you have your water will want to flow in and it will flow back out when the barrel is full. Then you can use your water from the spigots and you can choose if you want to do the planter on the top or if you just want to have a domed top on the barrel. Um, for maintaining your barrel, we already talked about this a lot. This will be in a handout that I'm giving you. Uh, you do want to clean your gutters, especially during the winter months. I recommend like once a month during the winter just to make sure you're, you don't have too much gunk trying to come into your system. Um, you know, your leaf feeders and your first flush diverter we already talked about. About every, every five years, you want to just take a hose and rinse out your barrel just to, to get everything out of it and then start fresh. And usually you'll do that at the end of the dry season so that you've already used all the water that's in there. If you do have a wine barrel, you want to make sure you always keep a little bit of water in there because they will dry out and then they'll seep a little bit as you come into the new rain. Um, we've talked a lot about how to use your water. Um, the only thing we didn't talk about, a lot of people ask if they can connect it into their toilet for flushing. Yes, you can, but you need a permit and you'll need a plumber to do that for you. That is not a DIY. So that's something you can again email me about. I can give you more information, but that will require a permit and it is a much bigger step. I really just recommend using these systems, especially your first system to just irrigate your landscaping. Um, so these are the three digital handouts we'll get. It's a gardening handout, kind of what to do each of the seasons for your garden. The one I talked about for converting a wine barrel and then a quick reference guide that is everything we talked about on this presentation, somewhat boiled down to one page that you can do when you take around your house when you're thinking about where to set up your system. Susie, I'm gonna hand it over to you to talk about other things. Great, all right guys, we're gonna wrap this up so we can get to more questions. Uh, we definitely wanna make sure we're answering those. But what some of you may have come here for was for a chance to win a free rain barrel. This is the Earth Minded Rain Station um, 50 gallon rain barrel that Chris had mentioned previously. So we're gonna be doing this raffle live um, for anyone who um, takes our post, or anyone who lives in the basketball service area who takes our post survey, uh, survey, uh, sorry, post online survey. Blah. <laughs> um, and this will come with the diverter kit, which Chris just mentioned. Um, and to be eligible to win, you must live within the Bosco service area. And on your right, you'll see the map of that service area if you're not familiar. And like I mentioned, you must fill out the post workshop survey. Um, in order to get to that survey, uh, I no longer have the chat function that I had before. So please go to this URL. It's flows to bay.org slash survey. Again, flows to bay.org slash survey. Chris, if you can leave that on the screen as people, please go online right now and do that. We'll, um, it's a quick two minute survey. We will allow people to um, fill that out and we'll do the live drawing at around, in around 10 minutes, we'll say 11.20. So please fill out that survey to be entered for the raffle. And as we leave this up, just a couple other mentions that we will be sending an email to all attendees with all of this wonderful information and the handouts that Chris mentioned, as well as the 20% um, discount um, that we were talking about. And just to answer some questions regarding it, um, specifically the Basqua rain barrel rebate, um, it does require a 50 gallon minimum size. Um, and there were some back and forth on the chat regarding what's available online. Um, Passit online, I believe is only down, they're really low stock. They're, they only have a 45 gallon barrel available, which is not, does not qualify for the minimum size. Um, the 20% discount is for in-store purchases for Hassett. So 
just to clarify that. And there is another opportunity if you do not win the prize at the end of today's webinar. Um, if you have a little bit of an artistic flair in you, we welcome you to join our t-shirt design contest where the winner will receive not only a 50 gallon rain, rain barrel, you'll also receive a $100 gift card and of course a shirt with your artwork on it. Uh, deadline is May 25th. And again, this will be part of that email that we send out just in case at that information that closedway.org slash t-shirt. And this is only available to San Mateo County residents. So Chris, if you can just go back to that URL, make sure people got it for the survey. We'll just leave that on. People are mentioning that the survey link isn't working for them, which is a little odd. Um, flows to bay.org slash survey. Hold on one second. I'm trying to, this was working this morning. Um, panelists, if you can confirm on your end, if you're having um, so it works for me. Um, you can't, unfortunately with the webinar, you can't just click on it. It's not a button. So you actually have to manually type it on your keyboard. So we apologize for that inconvenience. Um, but hopefully you're able to go on a browser and just type that in. Yep, typing it in, it came up for me. I do see it. Um, Susie, is there a spot for people, will, or will it give people's emails so that you're able to do the raffle from this? Yes, it will provide a, a name. So guys who are having trouble, if you can try um, to refresh your browser, it, it's coming up for all of us again that unfortunately we cannot <laughs> chat out the, the URL, but flows today org slash survey if you can try to refresh. So I'm going to go ahead and start doing some of these questions that I can see. Is that okay? I'm just going to um, start at the top and work my way down. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we have a question. Um, someone used to have a rain barrel with a mesh top, but local raccoons would rip the mesh off to get to the water. I do recommend using any of these designed rain barrels. Um, they're gonna come with plastic tops or be a fully contained unit. And with any of those, you're just gonna put a screw through the top to hold the top on. Uh, raccoons are super talented, but they're not gonna get a screwed top off. What do you mean? Like with a power tool, put a sheet metal screw through the two layers of plastic to screw your top on. And you know, just have your three-inch opening that has the the pipe going in or your downspout going directly in, and just have that as sealed as possible. You do still need that mesh to protect from the mosquitoes, but just having everything else sealed so that it can get in there. Um, if your property has a lot of moss and mushrooms growing throughout the year, yes, that does mean your grounds are generally fairly saturated. Um, it could also just mean that you've got a lot of shade. So the quickest way to do a drain test is dig about a one foot round hole down about six inches, fill it with water and time how long it takes to drain and you will see what your drainage rate is for your property. So this one uh, asks about the expected lifespan of a rain barrel. Um, for the larger barrels, like the 265 gallon, the 500 gallon, I would expect 20 years or I would be fairly angry with the company. For the 50 gallon ones, they are a thinner plastic. They aren't made to last as long, but I would still expect at least 10 years. Um, you can put a barrel on a deck, but I would not put a 500 gallon barrel on a deck. Um, you really want to think about the weight. Um, I have seen people that live in apartments do like a 50 gallon barrel on a deck on the apartment and tap into their downspout that runs next to it with that same diverter that lets it overflow back into the downspout. Um, 
you know, you really want to make sure you know what weight your deck is rated to before you put a lot of weight on it. And you may want to add supports directly underneath where the rain barrel is going to go. I would not put a large tank on a deck. Um, this one's also about the lifespan of the barrels. It asks how often to replace them. You know, you're, you're not replacing your barrel until something drastic happens and that's going to be a really long time, you know, probably 10 to 20 years. And, you know, it may even be longer. I just, the longest I've had a barrel so far is 10 years, but I'm, I'm a little younger. So if we have anyone on here who has had a barrel in place longer, feel free to answer with a Q&A. Um, Susie, you're going to email a list of recommended landscapers who can do this. Is that correct? We, we are going to include a list of installers in the area. Um, I would not say that they're recommended. We have not tried any of these installers, but we'll, it's rather a list to get people started um, on their installation journey. But I can't say that these necessarily come recommended just with that caveat. But there will be a list um, that you can start accessing once we send you that email. Perfect. And I'm also able to come out and consult just to help you get started for a DIY project. I will not be able to do natural installation on your property. Um, and my email will be included in the follow up email. Um, so here's a great question. This is their barrel is about six years old. But the plastic spout is breaking down and leaking. So what we're talking about here is I'm going to switch off that page. This little plastic spigot here. These do break down. They are plastic. I am not a huge fan. As I said earlier, I absolutely love using, where's my slide? I love using ball valves. So I would replace all those spigots after a couple of years with either a PVC ball valve or a brass ball valve. And those are gonna give you a lot longer life on your system than one of those turn to turn the water on spigots. Because you're probably gonna have to <laughs> wade through some of the... Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just, I, the ones I've already covered, I'm trying to dismiss. If, if Susie, if you want to go through and just dismiss the ones we've already covered, that would be awesome. Um, so having a rain garden replace a French drain is one of the questions. No. Um, so if you have a French drain, I recommend keeping it because um, currently the regulations in this area or if you have a French drain and you stop using it, you have to get a permit to reconnect to it. So if you have a French drain, use a downspout diverter such as this one that we talked about in a couple slides. Um, and that will allow the water to still go down your French drain after you fill your barrel. If you are just looking for a garden, um, you know, doing a rain garden, you can figure out another way to connect it that you don't have to disconnect from your downspout. Even using one of these diverters lower down and using the hose to go into your garden will work to divert part of the water into your garden without ever disconnecting you from that French drain, because I do not recommend ever disconnecting from the French drain if you have an intent of reconnecting later. If my drainage is connected to a sump pump, can I drill into the drainage piping without the sump pump being affected? Um, so we're not we're not looking to do the drainage with any of this. What we're looking at is the downspouts. So a sump pump is gonna be underneath the house. We're looking at taking it from the roof. We don't wanna deal with any of your plumbing underneath the house. Um, if you do have more questions, feel free to email me on that one. <laughs> this is a great one. So I live under a eucalyptus grove. Do you think I could still benefit from a rain barrel, especially since I use the water for irrigating my vegetable garden? Definitely. A eucalyptus grove is going to drop so much stuff on 
your house, though, I really do recommend both the leaf eater and that first flush diverter to clean up that water a little bit before going in. And yeah, use it to, to irrigate your vegetable garden. The eucalyptus itself is not gonna, it's not gonna hurt it at all. Um, Susie, there's a question about wells in Hillsborough. I'm gonna let you field that one. Yeah, no, I, uh, <laughs> uh, this is the first, this is the first after doing so many of these, no one has ever asked about wells. So, well, we will need to send this um, question. Oh, Jennifer, unless you have a, oh, an answer. Um, so yes, I work for the city of Burlingame, so I don't know the uh, regulations on the town of Hillsboro, and so unfortunately I don't know the answer to that, but I would just um, say please call your public works department if you live in the town of Hillsboro um, and ask what their, um, you know, because the building department or the public works department might have some regulations on that. So Susie, it looks like we're getting an internal server error when trying to submit the survey. Yeah, I'm, I, I can't troubleshoot. I don't know what's going on because some people are able to do it and we have a, at least 88 surveys <laughs> from the 112 participants that are online. So I'm not sure. Um, so I, I would say to everyone who got that internal error survey, just try again. There were probably 50 people trying to submit all at once. Right. It kind of overloaded the server, but we, we do have um, 88 surveys. So we, we will give it a, a few more minutes to make sure it's, it's you know, fair to everyone who couldn't get in. Um, and then realizing that this is after 11, I do want to thank folks for being here. If you have to run, we appreciate your time and thank you once more. And hopefully the email that we send will have um, any answers to questions you might have, um, including a link to a, a video of this webinar. Yes. Yeah, so that would be included in the follow-up email as well as Chris's email if you have any lingering questions. Um, Chris has agreed to um, share her email with you all, so you can just email her directly if your question was not answered already in this webinar. Okay, I'm, can I do a couple more questions? Yes, yeah, we'll, we'll wait for people who are still trying to get, yeah, for people who are still trying to get through, like I said, we have 88 um, surveys. So please keep trying at this point. Um, I think it's over, server overload. We did not expect this many people to be on, which is great and wonderful. But um, we'll, we'll give it a few more minutes, Chris, if you can continue. There's still more questions. Yep. I'm, I'm going to go through them. So um, I've got a couple questions about where to purchase things. Um, one is the first flush diverter. Um, you can get a first flush diverter from Urban Farmer up in San Francisco or online. Amazon actually has, has good ones while I am all for buying it locally. A lot of the hardware stores right now are just overwhelmed and don't have them in stock. But check your local hardware store first. You can call Urban Farmer in San Francisco, but you can also go on Amazon and get a good one. Uh, same thing for the leaf eaters. The most efficient leaf eaters I found are actually from an Australian rainwater harvesting country uh, company, um, and I get them through through Amazon, um, also through Urban Farmer up in San Francisco. They carry all of that. Um, there's a question about getting water from a rain chain rather than a direct downspout. Yes, you can. So. With the rain chain, you would anchor it inside the top of the barrel the same way you would. You would have to have your mesh underneath where the chain is anchored so that you still have that screening going into the barrel. But, you know, you're not going to get the full water flow because the rain chains tend to have a bit of splashage, splash, splash itch. I'm not sure that's a word. Um, but it's going to have a little bit of water that doesn't come straight down the rain chain, but you can anchor it into the center of the barrel to get that. Um, if you already ripped out your lawn and replaced it with drought resistant plants, I am so happy you did that. I'm so sorry though, the rebates really have to be applied for before you do your installation. Susie, correct me if I'm wrong. That is correct. Um, yeah, that's all I can say about that. Um, 
Jen, if you have anything to add, the I believe you have to show before and after pictures. So before you rip it out, you do they have to verify that this. For, was sorry done. for the rain barrel. For for any rate for any rebate the basketball rebate. So no so for the if you're doing a lawn. Uh, lawn be gone conversion, you do need a notice to proceed before you tear up your lawn. For the rain barrel rebate, I have personally applied for it um, for on behalf of my mom. Um, I installed the rain barrel at her house and got through and got the Bosco rebate. Um, and you um, have to show pictures after the installation. Um, but I mean, a picture of before would just be the downspout. Um, so no, you don't need to have that. And for anything I went over too quickly through this presentation, we were trying to cram a lot of information into an hour. This will be available on the BASQA website as well as Flows Today website. Is that correct, Susie, or just BASQA? We will try to post it on the Flows Today site as well. So you'll be able to find this and we will send you a link to it so that you will be able to go through this presentation. And you know, if there's a slide that you definitely want to go to, you'll be able to fast forward to that slide and take another look at it as you go through. Um, we have uh, another question about doing the mesh on the top um, for Nikhil Kale. I think, Nikhil, if you go ahead and email me, I can help you out with your specific situation. Uh, but generally, getting your water directly from a downspout is the most efficient way to do it. Um, we also have some people who have rain barrels but don't have hardware or have adapted their own rain barrels and don't have hardware. Um, the hardware you can get from any hardware store. Um, you can use bulkhead fittings to connect to PVC threaded fittings, or you can buy the kit that is, oops, sorry. This kit right here can be purchased at any hardware store or online um, if you're worried about going to a hardware store right now with our current conditions in the area. They are very easily accessible. All you're going to search is rain barrel diverter kit and then you want to find one that has a picture very similar to this picture that shows you all the parts and that will have everything that you need. Okay. Um, Jen or Chris, did you want to take that one vinegar one, last one? I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting one. I want to know the answer myself. <laughs> I've actually never used vinegar to keep bacteria growth to a minimum um, in in a rain barrel. I have heard of people using chlorine. Um, and it's like a teaspoon of chlorine in a 50 gallon barrel every like two months over the summer. So it's a very, very minimal amount. Um, vinegar seems like it would be a little bit better, but I, I have never used it or heard of it. So I think it would have to be a little bit of an experiment or a Google search. Okay. Um, with that being said, it's so there's like, another oh. person wrote in with an answer and I'm going to read it out. Um, because vinegar is a natural weed killer, it may kill your plants. So it seems like that might not be the best option, but I think vinegar used for killing plants is a much higher quantity. So if we're talking about a teaspoon in a 50 gallon barrel every two months, like the chlorine, um, again, I do your own research. The raffle winner does not need to be present to win. It's based on the survey, so we will email it to you. Yeah, with especially with the overage. We were going to try to do it live, but we understand the time went over and then some technical difficulties. So we want to make sure people have a, you know, the opportunity to submit the survey um, and making it fair. But we will announce um, and email the uh, winner um, either by the end of this weekend or first thing Monday morning. Um, do apologize for the technical issues that were, were not um, forthcoming. We did not realize that was gonna happen. 
Um, I, I'm going to go back to the vinegar real quick. Um, so by the power of Google, what I'm finding is that if you do a very small quantity, this is one cup. I wouldn't do more than a, a quarter cup of vinegar in, in a 50 gallon tank. Um, but as long as you're not going to use your water for a couple of days, it says that it will evaporate out of the water. So as long as you're not putting the vinegar in the same day you're using your water, you should be okay. But again, maybe test it on an area that you're less connected with to start. Okay. Um, seems like the Q and A is done. We, I do see some folks with their hands up. I'm not sure if that was from an earlier poll that you were doing or if people still have additional questions. Um, can you check to make sure that if you do have a question for Chris, that your hand remains up? If not, if that was from an earlier time, if you can lower your hand and we can try to get to you if you're willing to, um, to stick around. And thank you for everyone with the kind comments and notes. We hope this was in, informative to you. Um, and we hope to continue giving you this educational and hopefully what was fun um, information. And let's, let's install those rain barrels. But uh, Chris, are you okay with taking four more questions live? Or I, it Definitely. seems like there are still four hands raised. Definitely. All right, um, Victor P. I will allow you to unmute yourself if you do have a question. You have to unmute yourself on your end. I cannot do it for you. If you still have a question, we'll give you a few seconds. If, if not, I will move on to the next person who has their hand raised. So Victor P, um, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Otherwise, if you don't have a question, you can go ahead and lower your hand or I'll just give you a few more seconds and we can come back to you. The next person is Christine Oswald. Christine, I have allowed you to unmute yourself. You have to do that on your end on your Zoom. If you still have a question, please go ahead. Uh, which question? That was my question. Yeah, because I've been using the vinegar for, I think we've had the house for about two and a half years. But like, yeah, you should wait a day or two. But when I found a, a rain barrel, because the raccoons love to get into them, and it kind of keeps the raccoons from not wanting the water, and I, I think it does evaporate, and that's what we've been using, and it's, but it also kills the mosquitoes that, like, get in there. Okay. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, it, and, and my roses, some reason, like, the, the roses like it, but I have, I do wait a day or two. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I wish I had a green thumb. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Christine. Um, next person who has their hand up, Vanessa Baez. If you wanna unmute yourself um, and ask your question if you still have one, Vanessa Baez. Oh. Hi. Oh, hi. I was just wondering about the tarp, um, but I know I did do remember that they, Chris said that uh, she would send her email so that's probably something I can just uh, wait and get the email. And I'm intending to install the rainwater uh, collection on my dog park so we won't have a, a drain. But that's another thing I can probably email as well. Yeah, definitely send me an email. I can send you some videos. Um, that I've watched that I've really enjoyed about harvesting rainwater from a tarp um, okay. and and you can check those out and see if they're helpful. I personally have never done a system from a tarp because I don't have enough land to make that worthwhile. Okay. Um, and I'll, most most people I work with in this area can't make it worthwhile. So it's, it's definitely a possibility though. Okay send you some videos that I've seen of people doing that. Um, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. And we just had the best rain and thunderstorm ever. And all I can think about is, oh, that water I'm missing. <laughs> oh, that's great. We envy you here in the oh, Bay Area. Just, <laughs> thank well, you so much. We're supposed oh. to get more next week. All right. <laughs> Let's get it. Thank I'm you, Vanessa. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, um, Amy 
Bono, you will have the last question of the day. All you have to do is unmute yourself on your end. Hi, this is Amy. I, um, this may be beyond your um, control, but I've been on the Bosco website and they're not recognizing an account number for my water system. Like how does one troubleshoot? I have troubleshoot that, I guess. That is a great question, um, Amy. Um, Amy, can I ask, is this for a rebate or? Yeah, it's for the rebate. I, I have two water accounts because I have fire suppression in the house too. I'm using both account numbers and it, I'm trying to set up my password for the rebate and it continually tells me it doesn't recognize my account number. Okay. And it seems like another participant, Lynn, is having a very similar issue. Jen, do you have any notes or can we take these ladies? Um, contact information, forward them to... Yeah, so um, I would suggest calling Bosca. Um, their telephone number is on their website, which okay. I can read it off to you. Um, it's 650-349-3000. Again, it's 349-3000. Or you can also email them at bosca at bosca.org, and that's B-A-W-S-C-A. Um, or if you just Google Bosca.org. Um, yeah, so they are in charge of managing the rebate program. So as a city agency, I don't know um, what's happening on their back end, but they should be able to help you out. Great. And with the, can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. Go for it. With the rebate um, being limited to 50 gallon rain barrels, would I be able to buy two of a smaller amount and get a single rebate? And unfortunately, it is per barrel, I believe. Okay. Um, but you will be, I, I, they're not going to stay unavailable in hardware stores for long. And I, I think there are still some available in other hardware stores. Um, I mean, we love supporting Hasset, but since they are having trouble keeping them in stock, you can take a look at Lowe's or Home Depot. Some of the larger ones do still have them in stock. I can confirm okay. Home Depot has the same rain barrel and other rain barrels online, especially for delivery. Um, and yeah, Home Depot 100% has, has some stock for the 50. And while you won't get that 20% discount, you will still be fully covered by the rebate because it still ends up being less than $100. So if you're in the area that gets both of the $50 rebates for one system, you'll still be covered. Great, thanks a lot. Okay. Well, we've taken enough of your time. Like we said, um, so sorry on behalf of all of us for all the technical issues that uh, happened with the survey. We were not expecting that to happen. Um, it was just because we had a lot of people, <laughs> which was great. A lot of people wanted to learn about rain barrels and rain gardens and, and we couldn't thank you enough for your time and being here. We're gonna email out the winner. Um, we can also, so everyone under, knows who the winner was. Um, we can put that, Jen, I think, in our um, recap email to participants so we can celebrate the winner. Um, but thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for your time. I hope, we all hope that you've learned something and um, we hope to see you at one of our other webinars. And thank you for those of you that stuck it out for the end of Q&A. We really appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye-bye.